Chapter Three of Love Among the Artists. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Love Among the Artists by George Bernard Shaw. Chapter Three. On one of the last days of July, Mary Sutherland was in her father's house at Windsor, copying a sketch signed A. H. The room had a French window opening on a little pleasure ground and shrubbery, far beyond which, through the swimming summer atmosphere, was the river threading the distant valley. But Mary did not look that way. With her attention concentrated on a stained scrap of paper, she might have passed for an aesthetic daughter of the man with the muckrake. At last a shadow fell upon the drawing board. Then she turned and saw a tall, handsome lady, a little past middle age, standing at the window mrs herbert she exclaimed throwing down her brush and running to embrace the newcomer i thought you were in scotland so i was until last week the first person i saw in london was your aunt jane and she has persuaded me to stay at windsor with her for a fortnight how well you are looking i saw your portrait in adrian's studio and it is not the least bit like you i hope you did not tell him so besides it must be like me all adrian's artistic friends admire it yes and he admires their works in return it is a well understood bargain poor adrian he did not know that i was coming back from scotland and i gave him a very disagreeable surprise by walking into his studio on monday afternoon disagreeable i am sure he was delighted he did not even pretend to be pleased his manners are really getting worse and worse who is the curious person that opened the shrubbery gate for me a sort of cyclop with a voice of bronze it is only mr jack charlie's tutor he has nothing to do at present as charlie is spending a fortnight at cambridge oh indeed your aunt jane has a great deal to say about him she does not like him and his appearance rather confirms her i must say though he has good eyes whose whim was mr jack pray mine they say though i had no more to do with his being engaged than papa or charlie had i'm glad adrian had nothing to do with it well mary have you any news for me has anything wonderful happened since i went to scotland no at least i think not you heard of papa's aunt dorcas's death that was in april just before i went away i heard that you left london early in the season it is childish to bury yourself down here you must get married dear mary blushed did adrian tell you of his new plans she said adrian never tells me anything and indeed i do not care to hear of any plans of his until he has once for all given up his absurd notion of becoming a painter of course he will not hear of that he has never forgiven me for suggesting it all that his fine art has done for him as yet is to make him dislike his mother and i hope it may never do worse but mrs herbert you are mistaken i assure you you are quite mistaken he is a little sore perhaps because you do not appreciate his genius but he loves you very dearly do not trouble yourself about my not appreciating his genius as you call it my dear i am not one bit prejudiced against art and if adrian had the smallest chance of becoming a good painter i would share my jointure with him and send him abroad to study but he will never paint i am not what is called an aesthete and pictures that are generally understood to be the perfection of modern art invariably bore me because i do not understand them but i do understand adrian's daubs and i know that they are invariably weak and bad all the royal academy could not persuade me to the contrary though indeed they are not likely to try i wish i could make you understand that any one who dissuades adrian from pursuing art will be his best friend don't you feel that yourself when you look at his pictures mary no said mary fixing her glasses and looking boldly at her visitor i feel just the contrary then you must be blind or infatuated take his portrait of you as an example no one could recognize it even adrian told me that he would have destroyed it had you not forbidden him though he was bursting with suppressed resentment because i did not pretend to admire it i believe that adrian will be a great man yet and that you will acknowledge that you were mistaken in him well my dear you are young and not very wise for all your cleverness besides you did not know adrian's father no but i know adrian very well i think 
i have faith in the entire worthiness of his conceptions and he has proved that he does not grudge the hard work which is all that is requisite to secure the power of executing what he conceives you cannot expect him to be a great painter without long practice and study i do not understand metaphysics mary conceptions and executions are greek to me but i know very well that adrian will never be happy until he is married to some sensible woman and married he never can be whilst he remains an artist why what a question how can he marry with only three hundred a year he would not accept an allowance from me even if i could afford to make him one for since we disagreed about this wretched art he has withdrawn himself from me in every possible way and with an ostentation too which natural feeling apart is in very bad taste he will never add a penny to his income by painting of that i am certain and he has not enterprise enough to marry a woman with money if he persists in his infatuation you will find that he will drag out his life waiting for a success that will never come and he has no social talents if he were a genius like raphael his crotchets would not matter if he were a humbug like his uncle john he would flourish as all humbugs do in this wicked world but adrian is neither he is only a duffer poor fellow mary reddened and said nothing have you any influence over him said mrs herbert watching her if i had replied mary i would not use it to discourage him i am sorry for that i had some hope that you would help me to save him from wasting his opportunities your aunt jane has been telling me that you are engaged to him but that is such an old story now that i never pay any attention to it has adrian not told you my dear i have already said a dozen times that adrian never tells me anything the more important his affairs are the more openly and purposely he excludes me from them i hope you have not been so silly as to rely on his visions of fame for your future support the truth is that we have been engaged since last april i wanted adrian to write to you but he said he preferred to speak to you about it i thought he would have done so the moment you returned however i am sure he had good reasons for leaving me to tell you and i am quite content to wait until he reaps the reward of his labour we must agree to differ about his genius i have perfect faith in him well mary i am very sorry for your sake i am afraid if you do not lose patience and desert him in time you will live to see all your own money spent and to try bringing up a family on three hundred a year if you would only be advised and turn him from his artistic conceit you would be the best wife in england for him you have such force of character just what he wants mary laughed you are so mistaken in everything concerning adrian she said it is he who has all the force of character i am only his pupil he has imposed all his ideas on me more perhaps by dint of their purity and truth than of his own assertiveness for he is no dogmatist i am always the follower he the leader oh all very fine mary but my old-fashioned common sense is better than your clever modern nonsense however since adrian has turned your head there is nothing for it but to wait until you both come to your senses that must be your aunt jane at the door she promised to follow me within half an hour mary frowned and recovered her serenity with an effort as she rose to greet her aunt mrs beatty an elderly lady with features like mr sutherland's but fat and imperious she exclaimed i hope i've not come too soon mary how surprised you must have been to see mrs herbert yes mr jack let her into the shrubbery and she appeared to me at the window without a word of warning mr jack is a nice person to have in a respectable house said mrs beatty scornfully do you know where i saw him last no said mary impatiently and i do not want to know i am tired of mr jack's misdemeanours misdemeanours i call it scandal mary a perfect disgrace dear me what has he done now you may well ask he is at present showing himself in the streets of windsor in company with common soldiers openly entering the taverns with them oh aunt jane are you sure perhaps you will allow me to believe my own senses you know what a small town is mrs herbert and how everybody knows everybody else by sight in it let alone such a remarkable-looking person as this mr jack and the very first person i saw was private charles the worst character in my husband's regiment conversing with my nephew's tutor at the door of the green man 
they went into the bar together before my eyes now what do you think of your mr jack he may have had some special reason special reason fiddlestick what right has any servant of my brother's to speak to a profligate soldier in broad daylight in the streets there can be no excuse for it if mr jack had a particle of self-respect he would maintain a proper distance between himself and even a full sergeant but this charles is such a drunkard that he spends half his time in cells he would have been dismissed from the regiment long since only he is a bandsman and the bandmaster begs colonel beatty not to get rid of him as he cannot be replaced if he is a bandsman said mary that explains it mr jack wanted musical information from him i suppose i declare mary it is perfectly wicked to hear you defend such conduct is a public house the proper place for learning music why could not mr jack apply to your uncle if he had addressed himself properly to me colonel beatty could have ordered the man to give him whatever information was required of him i must say aunt that you are the last person i should expect mr jack to ask a favour from judging by your usual manner towards him there said mrs beatty turning indignantly to mrs herbert that is the way i am treated in this house to gratify mr jack last week i was told that i was in the habit of gossiping with servants because mrs williams's housemaid met him in the park on sunday on sunday mind whistling and singing and behaving like a madman and now when mary's favourite is convicted in the very act of carousing with the lowest of the low she turns it off by saying that i do not know how to behave myself before a tutor i did not say so aunt and you know that very well oh well of course if you are going to fly out at me i am not flying out at you aunt but you are taking offence without the least reason and you are making mrs herbert believe that i am mr jack's special champion you called him my favourite the truth is mrs herbert that nobody likes this mr jack and we only keep him because charlie makes some progress with him and respects him aunt jane took a violent dislike to him i mary what is mr jack to me that i should like or dislike him pray and she is always bringing me stories of his misdoings as if they were my fault then when i try to defend him from obvious injustice i am accused of encouraging and shielding him so you do said mrs beatty i say whatever i can for him said mary sharply because i dislike him too much to condescend to join in attacks made on him behind his back and i am not afraid of him though you are and so is papa oh really you are too ridiculous said mrs beatty afraid i see said mrs herbert smoothly that my acquaintance the cyclop has made himself a bone of contention here since you all dislike him why not dismiss him and get a more popular character in his place he is really not an ornament to your establishment where is your father mary he has gone out to dine at eton and he will not be back until midnight he will be so sorry to have missed you but he will see you to-morrow of course and you are alone here yes alone with my work then what about our plan of taking you back with us and keeping you for the evening i think i would rather stay and finish my work nonsense child said mrs beatty you cannot be working always come out and enjoy yourself mary yielded with a sigh and went for her hat i am sure that all this painting and poetry reading is not good for a young girl said mrs beatty whilst mary was away it is very good of your adrian to take such trouble to cultivate mary's mind but so much study cannot but hurt her brain she is very self-willed and full of outlandish ideas she is not under proper control poor charles has no more resolution than a baby and she will not listen to me all i am ready said mary returning you make me nervous you do everything so quickly said mrs beatty querulously i wish you would take shorter steps she added looking disparagingly at her niece's skirts as they went out through the shrubbery it is not nice to see a girl striding like a man it gives you quite a bold appearance when you swing along peering at people through your glasses that is an old crime of mine mrs herbert said mary i never go out with aunt jane without being lectured for not walking as if i had high-heeled boots even the colonel took me to task one evening here he said a man should walk like a horse and a woman like a cow his complaint was that i walk like a horse and he said that you aunt walk properly like a cow it is not worth any woman's while to gain such a compliment as that it made mr jack laugh for the first and only time in our house mrs beatty reddened and seemed about to make an angry reply 
when the tutor came in at the shrubbery gate and held it open for them to pass mrs herbert thanked him mrs beatty following her tried to look haughtily at him but quailed and made him a slight bow in response to which he took off his hat mr jack said mary stopping if papa comes back before i am in will you please tell him that i am at colonel beatty's at what hour do you expect him not until eleven at soonest i am almost sure to be back first but if by any chance i should not be i will tell him said jack mary passed on and he watched them until mrs beatty's carriage disappeared then he hurried indoors and brought a heap of manuscript music into the room the ladies had just left he opened the pianoforte and sat down before it but instead of playing he began to write occasionally touching the keys to try the effect of a progression or rising to walk up and down the room with puckered brows he laboured in this fashion until seven o'clock when hearing someone whistling in the road he went out into the shrubbery and presently came back with a soldier not perfectly sober who carried a roll of music paper and a case containing three clarionets now let us hear what you can make of it said jack seating himself at the piano it's cruel quick that allegro part is said the soldier trying to make his sheet of music stand properly on mary's table easel just give us your b flat will you mister jack struck the note and the soldier blew them ladies singin pianos is always so damn low he grumbled i've drawn the slide down as far as it'll come just wait while i stick a washer in the bloomin thing seems to me that you've been drinking instead of practising since i saw you said jack so help me governor i've been practising all the afternoon i only took a glass on my way here to set me to rights now mister i'm ready jack immediately attacked mary's piano with all the vigour of an orchestra and the clarionet soon after made its entry with a brilliant cadenza the soldier was a rapid executant his tone was fine in the only varieties of expression he was capable of the spirited and the pathetic satisfied even jack who on other points soon began to worry the soldier by his fastidiousness stop he cried that is not the effect i want at all it is not bright enough take the other clarionet try it in c what play all them flats on a clarionet in c can't be done leastways i'm damned if i can hello here's a gent for you sir jack turned adrian herbert was standing on the threshold astonished holding the handle of the open door i have been listening outside for some time he said politely i hope i do not disturb you no replied jack friend charles here is worth listening to eh mr herbert private charles looked down modestly jingled his spurs coughed and spat through the open window adrian did not appreciate his tone or his execution but he did appreciate his sodden features his weak and husky voice and his barrack accent seeing a clarionet and a red handkerchief lying on a satin cushion which he had purchased for mary at a bazaar he looked at the soldier with disgust and at jack with growing indignation i presume there is no one at home he said coldly miss sutherland is at mrs beatty's and will not return until eleven said jack looking at adrian with his most rugged expression and not subduing his powerful voice the sound of which always afflicted the artist with a sensation of insignificance mrs beatty and a lady who was visiting her called and brought her out with them mr sutherland is at eton and will not be back till midnight my pupil is still at cambridge hm said adrian i shall go on to mrs beatty's i should probably disturb you by remaining jack nodded and turned to the piano without further ceremony private charles had taken one of mary's paint-brushes and fixed it upon the desk against his sheet of music which was rolling itself up this was the last thing herbert saw before he left as he walked away he heard the clarionet begin the slow movement of the concerto a melody which in spite of his annoyance struck him as quite heavenly he nevertheless hastened out of earshot despising the whole art of music because a half-drunken soldier could so affect him by it half a mile from the sutherland's house was a gate through which he passed into a flower garden in which a tall gentleman with sandy hair was smoking a cigar this was colonel beatty from whom he learnt that the ladies were in the drawing-room there he found his mother and mrs beatty working in coloured wools whilst mary at a distance from them was reading a volume of browning she gave a sigh of relief as he entered is this your usual hour for making calls said mrs herbert in response to her son's cool good evening mother yes said he i cannot work at night 
he passed on and sat down beside mary at the other end of the room mrs beatty smiled significantly at mrs herbert who shrugged her shoulders and went on with her work what is the matter adrian said mary in a low voice why you look annoyed i am not annoyed but i am not quite satisfied with the way in which your household is managed in your absence by mr jack good heavens exclaimed mary you too am i never to hear the last of mr jack it is bad enough to have to meet him every day without having his misdeeds dinned into my ears from morning till night i think an end should be put to such a state of things mary i have often reproached myself for having allowed you to engage this man with so little consideration i thought his mere presence in the house could not affect you that his business would be with charlie only my experience of the injury that can be done by the mere silent contact of coarse natures with fine ones should have taught me better mr jack is not fit to live with you mary but perhaps it is our fault he has no idea of the region of thought from which i wish i never had to descend but after all we have no fault to find with him we cannot send him away because he does not appreciate pictures no but i have reason to believe that he is not quite so well behaved in your absence as he is when you are at home when i arrived to-night for instance i of course went straight to your house there i heard a musical entertainment going forward when i went in i was greeted with a volley of oaths which a drunken soldier was addressing to jack the two were in the drawing-room and did not perceive me at first jack being seated at your pianoforte accompanying the soldier who was playing a flageolet the fellow was using your table easel for a desk and your palette knife as a paperweight to keep his music flat has jack your permission to introduce his military friends whenever you are out certainly not said mary reddening i never heard of such a thing i think mr jack is excessively impertinent what is the matter said mrs beatty perceiving that her niece was vexed nothing aunt said mary hastily please do not tell aunt jane she added in an undertone to adrian why not oh she will only worry about it pray do not mention it what ought we to do about it adrian simply dismiss mr jack forthwith but yes i suppose we should the only difficulty is mary hesitated and at last added i am afraid he will think that it is out of revenge for his telling charlie not to take his ideas of music from my way of playing it and because he despises my painting despises your painting do you mean to say that he has been insolent to you you should dismiss him at once surely such fears as you expressed just now have no weight with you mary mary reddened again and said a little angrily it is very easy for you to talk of dismissing people adrian but if you had to do it yourself you would feel how unpleasant it is adrian looked grave and did not reply after a short silence mary rose crossed the room carelessly and began to play the piano herbert instead of sitting by her and listening as his habit was went out and joined the colonel in the garden what have you quarrelled about dear said mrs herbert we have not quarrelled said mary what made you think that adrian is offended oh no at least i cannot imagine why he should be he is i know what adrian's slightest shrug signifies mary shook her head and went on playing adrian did not return until they went into another room to sup then mary said she must go home and herbert rose to accompany her good night mother he said i shall see you to-morrow i have a bed in the town and will go there directly when i have left mary safely at home he nodded shook hands with mrs beatty and the colonel and went out with mary they walked a hundred yards in silence then mary said are you offended adrian mrs herbert said you were he started as if he had been stung i do not believe i could make a movement he replied indignantly for which my mother would not find some unworthy motive she never loses an opportunity to disparage me and to make mischief she does not mean it adrian it is only that she does not quite understand you you sometimes say hard things of her although i know you do not mean to speak unkindly pardon me mary i do i hate hypocrisy of all kinds and you annoy me when you assume any tenderness on my part towards my mother i dislike her i believe i should do so even if she had treated me well and showed me the ordinary respect which i have as much right to from a parent as from any other person our natures are antagonistic our views of life and duty incompatible we have nothing in common that is the plain truth 
and however much it may shock you unless you are willing to accept it as unalterable i had rather you would drop the subject oh adrian i do not think it is right to i do not think mary that you can tell me anything concerning what is called filial duty that i am not already familiar with i cannot help my likes and dislikes i have to entertain them when they come to me without regard to their propriety you may be quite tranquil as far as my mother's feelings are concerned my undutiful sentiments afford her her chief delight a pretext for complaining of me mary looked wistfully at him and walked on downcast he stopped turned towards her gravely and resumed mary i suspect from one or two things you have said that you cherish a project for reconciling me to my mother you must relinquish that idea i myself exhausted every effort to that end long ago i disguised the real nature of my feeling towards her until even self-deception the most persistent of all forms of illusion was no longer possible in those days i should have hailed your good offices with pleasure now i have not the least desire to be reconciled to her as i have said we have nothing in common her affection would be a burden to me therefore think no more of it whenever you wish to see me in my least amiable mood reopen the subject and you will be gratified i shall avoid it since you wish me to i only wish to say that you left me in an awkward position to-day by not telling her of our engagement true that was inconsiderate of me i intended to tell her but i got no opportunity it matters little she would only have called me a fool did you tell her yes when i found that aunt jane had told her already and what did she say oh nothing she reminded me that you were not rich enough to marry and proclaimed her belief that i should never become so unless i gave up painting she was quite kind to me about it but she is a little prejudiced yes i know for heaven's sake let us think and talk about something else look at the stars what a splendid dome they make of the sky now that there is no moon to distract attention from them and yet a great artist with a miserable yard of canvas can move us as much as that vast expanse of air and fire yes i am very uncomfortable about mr jack adrian if he is to be sent away it must be done before charlie returns or else there will be a quarrel about it but then who is to speak to him he is a very hard person to find fault with and very likely papa will make excuses for him sooner than face him with a dismissal or worse again he might give him some false reason for sending him away in order to avoid an explosion and somehow i would rather do anything than condescend to tell mr jack a story if he were any one else i should not mind so much there is no occasion to resort to untruth which is equally odious no matter to whom it is addressed it was agreed that his engagement should be terminable by a month's notice on either side let mr sutherland write him a letter giving that notice no reason need be mentioned and the letter can be courteously worded thanking him for his past services and simply saying that charlie is to be placed in other hands but it will be so unpleasant to have him with us for a month under a sentence of dismissal well it cannot be helped there is no alternative but to turn him out of the house for misconduct that is impossible a letter will be the best i wish we had never seen him or that he were gone already hush listen a moment they stopped the sound of a pianoforte came to their ears he is playing still said mary let us go back for colonel beatty he will know how to deal with the soldier the soldier must have left long ago said adrian i can hear nothing but the piano let us go in he is within his bargain as far as his own playing goes he stipulated for that when we engaged him they went on as they neared the house grotesque noises mingled with the notes of the pianoforte mary hesitated and would have stopped again but adrian with a stern face walked quickly ahead mary had a key of the shrubbery and they went round that way the noise becoming deafening as they approached the player was not only pounding the keyboard so that the window rattled in its frame but was making an extraordinary variety of sounds with his own larynx mary caught adrian's arm as they advanced to the window and looked in jack was alone seated at the pianoforte his brows knitted his eyes glistening under them his wrists bounding and rebounding upon the keys his rugged countenance transfigured by an expression of extreme energy and exaltation he was playing from a manuscript score 
and was making up for the absence of an orchestra by imitations of the instruments he was grunting and buzzing the bassoon parts humming when the violoncello had the melody whistling for the flutes singing hoarsely for the horns barking for the trumpets squealing for the oboes making indescribable sounds in imitation of clarionets and drums and marking each sforzando by a toss of his head and a gnash of his teeth at last abandoning this eccentric orchestration he chanted with the full strength of his formidable voice until he came to the final chord which he struck violently and repeated in every possible inversion from one end of the keyboard to the other and he sprang up and strode excitedly to and fro in the room at the second turn he saw herbert and mary who had just entered staring at him he started and stared back at them quite disconcerted i fear i have had the misfortune to disturb you a second time said herbert with suppressed anger no said jack in a voice strained by his recent abuse of it i was playing by myself the soldier whom you saw here has gone to his quarters as he mentioned the soldier he looked at mary it was hardly necessary to mention that you were playing said adrian we heard you at a considerable distance jack's cheek glowed like a sooty copper kettle and he looked darkly at herbert for a moment then with some signs of humour in his eye he said did you hear much of my performance we heard quite enough mr jack said mary approaching the piano to place her hat on it jack quickly took his manuscript away as she did so i am afraid you have not improved my poor spinet she added looking ruefully at the keys that is what a pianoforte is for said jack gravely it may have suffered but when next you touch it you will feel that the hands of a musician have been on it and that its heart has beaten at last he looked hard at her for a moment after saying this and then turned to herbert and continued miss sutherland was complaining some time ago that she had never heard me play neither had she because she usually sits here when she is at home and i do not care to disturb her then i am glad she has been gratified at last by a performance which is i assure you very characteristic of me perhaps you thought it rather odd i did think so said herbert severely then said jack with a perceptible surge of his subsiding excitement i am fortunate in having escaped all observation except that of a gentleman who understands so well what an artist is if i cannot compose as you paint believe that it is because the art which i profess lies nearer to a strong man's soul than the one which nature has endowed you with the power of appreciating good night he looked for a moment at the two turned on his heel and left the room they stared after him in silence and heard him laugh subduedly as he ascended the stairs i will make papa write to him to-morrow said mary when she recovered herself no one shall have a second chance of addressing a sarcasm to you adrian in my father's house whilst i am mistress of it do not let that influence you mary i am not disposed to complain of the man's conceited ignorance but he was impertinent to you i do not mind that but i do nothing could be more grossly insolent than what he said about your piano many of his former remarks have passed with us as the effect of a natural brusquerie which he could not help i believe now that he is simply ill-mannered and ill-conditioned that sort of thing is not to be tolerated for one moment i have always tried to put the best construction on his actions and to defend him from aunt jane said mary i am very sorry now that i did so the idea of his calling himself an artist musicians often arrogate that title to themselves said herbert and he does not seem overburdened with modesty i think i hear mr sutherland letting himself in at the hall door if so i need not stay any longer unless you wish me to speak to him about what has occurred oh no not to-night it would only spoil his rest i will tell him in the morning herbert waited only to bid mr sutherland good-night then he kissed his betrothed and went to his lodging End of chapter three recording by expatriate in bangor maine